In today's video, we're doing a countdown of top 10 facts that you can't afford to miss on AP Biology. Let's roll the intro. Hey guys, this is Mikey with AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Biology content. So if you're new here, be sure to click that like and subscribe button for your shot at a five on the May exam. In today's special episode, we're doing a countdown of some major concepts that you have to know for AP Biology. So without further ado, let's begin right away. Coming in at number 10 is, everything works through chemical interactions. While this might seem like an obvious fact, one thing that we have to be careful about in biology is thinking that things just happen. One specific example of this is transcription. During transcription, it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking that RNA polymerase simply knows to place a uracil against an adenine. But in reality, the only reason that this matching happens at all is because uracil and adenine have those corresponding structures to form those two hydrogen bonds. And the formation of that bond, well, that triggers another chemical interaction that lets the polymerase know chemically that the right match has been made. Now, this is also true of ligand receptor interactions, substrate enzyme binding, and pretty much every biochemical process that occurs within our cells. At number nine, we have energy is not free. Okay, so I'm borrowing a bit from chemistry and physics here, but because living things exist within a physical world with chemical building blocks, we have to draw from the other side of the aisle every once in a while. Here, I'm talking about the flow of energy through numerous systems. Say you wanna move those chromosomes down the spindle fiber during anaphase. It requires energy. This energy comes from ATP, which was created through the breakdown of glucose. Glucose in turn was formed through the complex series of reactions during the Calvin cycle, which was sufficiently powered by the substrates that were produced in the light reaction. And of course, light, as it were, came from the sun, which is a massive nuclear fusion reactor. So keeping track of energy and knowing that energy is involved in every biochemical reaction will help you place many FRQ and MCQ in the right context, particularly in the context of unit three on energetics. Coming in at number eight is that time is relative. I'm really not trying to channel Einstein here. What I mean by this is that the way that we think about time depends on the systems that we're investigating. For instance, when Stephen Jay Gould described evolution as occurring through a punctuated process where organisms evolve quickly, he didn't mean minutes or hours. He still meant hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Now, this is especially important in ecology when we talk about things like climax communities. Even if a certain oak forest is a climax community with some level of stability, that's only in the context of discussing ecological succession. In half a billion years, there's a good chance that the forest will be a desert or an Arctic ice cape. Time should always be measured in the context of the scope and the scale of our investigation. And at lucky number seven, its variation matters. As we move from the first half of the AP bio into the second, we quickly learn that genetic information is what survives us. Like in a hundred years, my body won't be here, but my genes will be. And this is where we want variation, especially during the process of producing our own offspring. You see, variation among your offspring is what safeguards against the unpredictability of the future. And what we see in AP bio is that events like meiosis, and random fertilization and even horizontal gene transfers that exist in bacteria evolve to maximize that variability in the population. Number six is related to number seven, but in a slightly different way. It is that diversity is good for population and communities. When we talk about genetic diversity within a population, we're talking about how varied each individual is within a species. There are species with low genetic variation and some with large variation, but all else equal, we can predict that species or populations with higher genetic variation will be better protected against cataclysmic events such as a plague, pandemic, or even climate catastrophes. This is because, just like what we said about varying your offspring, a greater number of variants ensures that some of the individuals within the population will survive whatever nature may throw at them. But you can even extend this analogy further into communities. Some communities have greater species diversity, while others not so much. Here again, we can predict that communities with greater species diversity would be more resilient because the complex relationships within a diverse community makes it harder for things like invasive species to invade and generally provide a greater number of species that can do the job at each trophic level covering for each other's niches should one of those go locally extinct. Coming in at number five, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. Now I know that this one sounds a bit random, but hear me out. Glycolysis is commonly thought to be a universal process that evolved a long time ago. This means that we can make some predictions about the process. For one, we should expect glycolysis to be present in all species of living things from bacteria to humans, and that seems to be true. And secondly, we can predict that glycolysis alone should be anaerobic. 
Why? Well, because it evolved a long time ago before Earth had a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. So obviously the process should not necessitate oxygen for it to proceed if it evolved way back then. Lastly, if it evolved that long ago and it's also universal in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, then it should occur in the cytoplasm. That's because prokaryotes don't have organelles. So if it's a common process, then it has to occur in a common area, which the cytoplasm is. <coughs> All right, so we're getting to the really good stuff now, but before we proceed, if you think this video has been helpful to you so far, click that like button and share it with a friend. If you don't like the video, then maybe share it with a friend that you hate. Awesome, let's get back to it. Number four is one of my favorite. Some genes mutate faster than others. Okay, so this one needs a little bit of explanation because we know that mutation is a random process, so it doesn't make sense for certain genes to mutate at a faster rate than others if the polymerase makes errors at a random rate. But that being said, it is true that certain genes over the same period of time seems to accumulate more mutations compared to, say, some more conserved genes. So what's going on here? Well, while the mutation rate may be the same, survivability of the genes with those mutations need not be the same. So let's take an example. A mutation on a gene that encodes for a component of the ribosome is said to be extremely low. And and it's very conserved, meaning that very little mutation accumulates there over time. This is because ribosomes, the thing that makes your proteins, is super important. So if something goes wrong on that gene, well, the embryo will not survive to pass that mutation on. So over time, heavily selected genes appear to accumulate fewer mutations while non-coding areas of the genome, well, they can accumulate mutation at a relatively consistent rate. In fact, this is what allows us to use those regions as a molecular clock to figure out how long ago certain species had diverged. Number three, some data are better predictors of evolutionary relationships than others. This is one that comes out often on the exam. Evolutionary biology is a difficult subject because the data is scarce and we can't always know exactly what happened in the past. So what scientists try to do is to use as much data we have on hand to make predictions about past evolutionary relationships. And in doing so, though, we can deal with lots of different types of data. Sometimes we might have to use morphological data like skeletons or fossils, behavioral data like a bird song, or molecular data, both DNA and proteins. Now, when comparing these types of data specifically, scientists generally agree that molecular data is more accurate than morphological data. And here's an example of why that might be the case. While there are cases in which large morphological changes can be seen through very small genetic changes, if genes that are in charge of development or body segmentation mutate, it might be hard for scientists to detect that these two very different looking organisms are actually really closely related together. So for the AP bio exam, always rely on molecular data more than morphological data or behavioral data for that matter. Number two, evolution really is the unifying theory. This one goes without saying, but AP biology is a course that synthesizes a number of topics across a large array of disciplines within biology under a single rubric. But the key that holds everything together is evolution. From molecular evolution to speciation, much of the great questions that we ask in biology can be and should be addressed from an evolutionary perspective. Say, if I were to ask why do desert foxes have big ears, a proximate answer may be that they have big ears to maximize the surface area through which they can dissipate heat from the blood vessels to the environment. And that is actually correct. It's a great adaptation that does just that. But if we keep asking this question of why deeper and deeper and deeper, then we get to the bedrock by addressing this question through an evolutionary lens. Say, for example, maybe there were lots of variation among the fox's ear size as they started to live in this ever warming environment. The foxes with larger ears would have had better chance of surviving and reproducing. And you know how the rest of the story goes. They leave more offspring. And over time, the ears get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as simple as it sounds, Darwin was truly a genius in seeing through that survivorship bias of explaining adaptations of organisms. And finally, we get to number one. Now, this one isn't in its position because it's the most important fact for biology in general, but it is one of the most important facts for AP biology, and that is that structure and function are inseparable. From unit one's discussion of enantiomers and why left-handed variants of drugs work while the right-hand variants don't, to hormones and their ability to engage with proteins, to numerous biochemicals that can be activated or deactivated via chemical additions like phosphate, the theme that pays the most dividends in this course is that structure lends to function and vice versa. Each year, there's always a question that asks why a certain protein can do what it does with the attachment or detachment of some substrate, and the answer is always the same. Changes in the structure lends to changes in its function. So it's so important in every single unit that we know this fact, and so it absolutely takes the crown as the number one fact that you have to know 
for this AP Biology course and the exam. So guys, that's my list, but what's yours? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you think I'm missing something, put that up too so we can all benefit from this conversation. And thanks for watching. This has been Mikey with AVO Prep Academy. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.